Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapter 1. Call me Ishmael. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, how long is not important, I found myself with no money and nothing to interest me on land. Whenever I feel depressed like this, I know it's time to go to sea. However, I never go as a passenger, and I never have the money to pay. And why should I pay? I always go to sea as a simple sailor, to get paid, to get exercise, and to breathe the pure sea air. I had never been on a whaling ship before. I normally sail on ships that take spices and treasure from one part of the world to another. But this time I decided that I wanted to sail in the hunt for whales, those great monsters of the deep seas. So I travelled to a town called New Bedford, and on my arrival I found that I had to wait a night and a day for a ship to take me to Nantucket. At the time this was the most famous whaling port in the whole world. After walking the streets for some time I arrived at a place called the Spouter Inn. I decided to go in. There were no free beds in the inn, but the owner told me that there was a large bed that I could share with a harpooner from a whaling ship. He told me that the man was out, walking around town trying to sell human heads. I was not sure I wanted to share a bed, even a large one, with another man, especially a man trying to sell human heads. However, the only alternative was to sleep on a table in the bar, so I asked the owner to show me the room. When I arrived it was empty, so I got into the bed and quickly went to sleep. Later on that night, I was woken up by a man entering the room holding a candle in one hand and a human head in the other. He didn't see me, and I was able to watch him in the candlelight. He was a huge man, with a shaved head, and the whole of his body was covered in tattoos. He was clearly from the South Sea Islands, and I wondered if he was even a cannibal. At that moment, I was as scared of him as I am scared of the devil. He looked into a bag he had, and took out a wooden idol in the shape of a small baby. For perhaps a minute, he whispered some prayers to this tiny god. Then he put out his candle and jumped into bed. He was very surprised to see me. O e you, I kill e, shouted the cannibal as he jumped back out of bed. Landlord, I screamed. Thankfully, the landlord came quickly to the room holding a candle. Don't be afraid of Keekeg. He wouldn't harm a hair on your head, the landlord said with a big smile on his face. Well, why didn't you tell me he was a cannibal? I thought you would know. I did tell you he was out selling heads. Keekeg, this man sleep e you, you sabi? Me sabi a lot, said Keekeg in a low voice. For a moment, I was able to have a good look at the savage. He was generally quite clean and friendly looking, so I decided that it was better to sleep with a sober savage than a drunken Christian. When I woke up the next day, my new friend was shaving with his harpoon, which must have been incredibly sharp. I spent some time with Keked during the day, and he told me about his life. He was from the South Seas, and his home was 20,000 miles away. That evening we ate supper together, and then smoked some of Keked's tobacco. He told me that I was a great friend, and gave me the human head he had been trying to sell. The next day, we decided to sail to Nantucket together, and look for a whaling ship we could work on. During the journey, I noticed that the crew were making a joke of Keekeg. While he walked around the ship, they would follow him and mimic his walk. Keekeg saw one of them doing this, and quite calmly dropped his bag and harpoon, picked up the man, and threw him across the deck. Captain! Captain! It's the devil! The man cried. Hey, you! You could have killed that man, the captain shouted. What him say? he asked me. Him say you near kill e that man there, I said, trying to speak in his strange way so that he could understand me easily. Him? No. Him, small fish. Kikeg no kill e him. Kikeg kill e big whale. When we arrived in Nantucket, there were three whaling ships in the harbour. Keekeg told me that he had been talking with his little god Yojo, and that I should decide which boat to take. 
I walked to where the ships were and had a look around. It seemed that there were three ships, the Devil Dam, the Titbit, and the Pecod. The Pecod is the name of a famous tribe of American Indians, now extinct. I decided that this was the ship that Kikog and I would travel on. On the deck of the ship there was a strange tent in the shape of a wigwam. I could just see that an old man was sitting inside. I walked over to him and asked him in a loud voice, Are you the captain of the ship? What if I am? What do you want? came the reply. I could see his face better now. He had skin like leather. Later on, I found out that this was Captain Peleg, one of the owners of the Pecod. I want to sail on this ship. And what do you know about whaling? I've been a sailor, and I asked you what you knew about whaling, not sailing, interrupted the old man. Well, I want to see the world, and I want to see what whaling is. You want to see what whaling is? Well, just look at Captain Ahab. Who? He's the one-legged captain of this ship. What happened to his other leg? Was it lost to a whale? <laughs> lost to a whale? It was bitten off and chewed up by a monster of a whale. So if you want to see whaling, look for the captain, and if you want to see the world, look over that side of the ship. I looked over and saw nothing but the endless ocean. What do you have to say? Not much, nothing but water and a few clouds, I replied. So, what do you think of the world? Do you wish to see any more of it? I didn't know what to say, but the old man helped me. I'll take you. You can sign up now. After signing my papers, I left, but on the walk back to the inn, I began to think about Ahab. It was always a good idea, before sailing on a ship, to meet its captain. Turning back, I walked up to Captain Peleg and asked him where I could find Captain Ahab. And what do you want of the captain? asked Peleg. I would like to speak to him, I replied. He isn't available at the moment. I think he's a little sick. He's a strange man, Ahab, but a good one. Doesn't speak much, but when he does speak, you should listen. Anyway, I always say it's better to sail with a moody good captain than a laughing bad one. Hearing this, I left the ship and went to meet Kikeg. Chapter 2 Captain Ahab and Moby Dick The next day, Kikeg and I walked down to the harbour to see Pekod, the whaling ship. As we approached the ship, Captain Peleg shouted that no cannibals were allowed on the ship. As we got closer to the ship, I introduced my friend as Kikeg, a man of great experience on whaling ships. What a harpoon you have there. I say, Cog, or whatever your name is, have you ever hit a fish with it? Without saying a word, Kikeg jumped onto the ship wildly, and then raising his harpoon, he said, Captain, you see him small barrel in water. You see him, if him one whale eye, well then. And taking aim, he threw the harpoon straight into the barrel. Now, said Kikeg, if him whale eye, then that whale dead. Well, we must have you, Hedgehog, I mean, Cog. Please, come and sign up for the ship, asked Peleg, after he had seen Kikeg's skill with the harpoon. And so Kikeg and I were accepted onto the ship, which would be leaving the next day. It was nearly six o'clock in the morning as we walked to the ship. It was very foggy and the light was not good. As we walked, I thought I saw other men walking towards the harbour, but when we reached the Pecod, it seemed empty and the cabin was locked. We looked around and found one man sleeping on the deck. I woke him and asked when the ship was due to sail. She sails today. Captain Ahab arrived last night, replied one of the seamen. So I took my things onto the boat with Kikeg, and as the day continued, the rest of the crew also arrived but nothing was seen of the captain. I met the three mates of the ship. The first was Starbuck, a native of Nantucket. He was a thin man, with such dark skin that he looked almost Egyptian. Looking into his eyes, you could see that he had seen many dangers in his life, but always stayed calm. 
The second mate was Stubb, a very cheerful man who never seemed to worry. A deadly meeting with a whale was the same to him as an evening meal at the captain's table. The third mate was called Flask, a short young man who hated whales more than anything. His mission in life was to destroy these great animals wherever he could find them. There were also three exotic harpooners on the boat. The first you know is Kikeg, the second was called Tashtega, an American Indian who had long straight black hair and high cheekbones. He looked like a proud warrior hunter of the distant past. The third was called Dagu, a giant black savage who was as tall as a giraffe. There was also Pip, the black cabin boy. He would dance around the ship shaking his tambourine and singing songs to himself. There were many other men on the ship, but their importance to my story is not great. For several days after our journey began, nothing was seen of Ahab. But one morning, when I woke up and went onto the main deck, I saw him standing there. His tall, broad body seemed to be made of bronze. Instead of the leg which he had lost on a whale hunt, he had a long white piece of whalebone. He had a very serious expression on his face, as if something terrible had happened to him. From that morning on, he was seen every day standing on the deck of the ship, watching his men. One morning, Ahab called everyone to come to the main deck of the ship. We had finally arrived in the southern waters where whales could be found. The captain put his hand inside his coat and pulled out a bar of gold. See this, man? This is an ounce of Spanish gold, man. The crew watched with great interest as the captain continued. Whoever sings out when he sees a white-headed whale will receive this gold. Hurrah! cried the seaman. Captain Ahab, said Tashtega, that white whale must be the same they call Moby Dick. Moby Dick, shouted Ahab. Do you know the white whale then, Tash? Captain Ahab, said Starbuck, I have heard of Moby Dick. Was it not Moby Dick that took off your leg? Who told you that? For yes, it was Moby Dick that took my leg and I'll chase him round the world from Norway to the Antarctic, and into hell if I need to. And what price will this whale make on the market at Nantucket? asked Starbuck. I am not an accountant, I am a sea captain, shouted the captain. Revenge on an animal? This is madness, replied Starbuck. But no one could argue with Ahab, and so the rum was brought out onto the deck, and the whole crew drank to the death of Moby Dick. Not many more days passed before the first whale was seen by the crew. There she blows! cried the man at the top of the mast. Ahab became very excited and cried out, It's time! Slowly, five people appeared from below decks. They looked like ghosts in their strange foreign clothing. Their leader was a tall man with only one front tooth. He was dressed in a Chinese jacket made from black cotton. The five of them looked as if they were going to a funeral. The whole crew stared at these strangers. Are you all ready, Fedala? Ready! Fedala, their leader, hissed like a snake. And so the new crew climbed into one of the boats with Ahab and began to chase the whale. On the deck, Flask and Stubb could be seen talking together. Ah, what do you think of those new yellow boys, sir? said Stubb to Flask. A sad business having those devils on their ship, Mr. Stubb. But it was the captain's decision. And so the two seamates went to their wading boats to chase the whale. Ahab's crew were soon a long way ahead of the other boats. It seemed like the Yellow Tiger crew were made of steel. They rode faster than any man had ever seen. After a long chase, Ahab's boat and Starbuck's boat got close to the whale. Kikeg, who was soon on Starbuck's boat, threw his harpoon at the whale, but the wound was not very bad. The fish then swam deep into the water and wasn't seen for several minutes. Then, suddenly, the whale smashed through the bottom of Starbuck's boat, sending all the men into the water, and the whale managed to escape all our harpoons. Chapter 3 The Madness of the Peckod during the chase for the whale, a man on Stubb's boat had hurt his wrist, 
and Pip, the cabin boy, was asked to replace him. On the next whale hunt, Pip was very nervous, but luckily for him the whale escaped without a fight. The second time he had to go out on the boat, he wasn't so lucky. A whale was harpooned by Tastega, and during the struggle Pip became absolutely terrified and jumped off the boat, which was a very dangerous thing to do. He got caught in the harpoon rope, which had wrapped itself around his body and was taken underwater when the whale dived into the blue sea. Tashtego stood at the end of the boat, holding a large knife to the rope. He looked at Stubb for the order to cut. It was clear that he hated Pip for being a coward, and that he would be happy to let the poor boy drown in the water. Cut! asked Tashtego. Do it for God's sake! came the order, and so the whale was lost and Pip was saved. As soon as Pip had recovered, Stubb gave him some serious fatherly advice. Never jump off the boat. If you do it again, I won't help you. A whale would sell for thirty times what you would in Alabama. So, although man loves his fellow man, he is also a money-making animal. Unfortunately, Pip's fears of whales was greater than his fear of stub. When the next whale was harpooned and began to swim at high speed, Pip jumped off the boat. Stubb was true to his word and left Pip behind. The boat travelled fast, and in a few minutes Pip was all on his own in the ocean. But Pip didn't die. The peckod luckily passed him following the other boats, and he was picked up out of the colossal ocean. But the experience made him a very different person. From the hour he was picked up, he became a madman walking the deck and talking nonsense to himself and the rest of the crew. The ocean had taken his soul, but left his body behind. Ahab showed some mercy for poor Pip, and after the cabin boy went mad, Ahab spent a lot of time with him, talking in the captain's cabin. The boy's madness interested Ahab. He thought that perhaps Pip could talk to the gods. Pip thought that he was safer with the strong captain, and he always held Ahab's hand while they were talking. Days passed and another whaling ship was seen. "'Have you seen the white whale?' shouted Ahab to the other ship's captain. The two captains were perhaps twenty metres apart, and so each could be seen by the crew of the other. "'Have you seen this?' shouted the other captain, and pulled up the right sleeve of his coat. There was no human arm underneath this. Instead, there was a white arm made of whalebone. At the end, instead of a hand, was a large wooden hammer." "'Oil, come and see you!' Ahab said excitedly, and got into one of the boats with his adviser, Fedella, to meet the one-armed captain. As soon as he was on the deck of the other ship, the two men greeted each other. Captain Boomer, for that was his name, held out his white arm. Ahab walked forward and crossed the bone arm with his bone leg, and cried, "'Aye, aye, let's shake bones together. So tell me, where did you see the white whale?' The white whale, I saw him in the east, he said, pointing with his arm. And he took off that arm, did he? He was the cause of it. So, tell me the story then. It was last year. I knew nothing of the white whale at the time, and we saw a group of whales together. We soon harpooned one of them, but the next thing we saw was the white head and back of a sperm whale come up from the bottom of the sea. I decided that we had to take this fish. He was a mighty fighter, and he smashed my boat in two. I fell into the water, and was able to stab him with my harpoon. To avoid his attacks, I held on to the harpoon I had stabbed into him, but I was cut by another harpoon that was in the fish. I got back to my ship, but the wound from the harpoon didn't heal. When my arm turned black, I had to have it amputated. It was a terrible wound, said the ship's doctor, who had so far been watching him from a distance. Have you seen him since? asked Ahab excitedly. Twice, replied Boomer. But you couldn't take him? I didn't try. Isn't one arm enough? I didn't know him when I met him before, but I know him now. I agree it would be good to kill him, but it's better to leave him alone. He will be hunted by me. That fish is like a magnet to me. He pulls me to him. The ship's doctor had come closer and was taking an interest in Ahab. Suddenly he spoke. Bless me, cried the doctor. 
This man's blood, it must be boiling, and his pulse is enough to make the whole ship beat. Get away from me, cried Ahab. Which way was the whale going? he asked as he got into his boat. When I last saw him it was east, a sailor said, and then turning to Fedela, What's the matter? Has your captain gone mad? But Fedela simply put his finger to his lips and climbed over the side of the ship to follow his master. A few days later, the first mate Starbuck was checking the inside of the ship and found that the barrels with oil were leaking. In fact, quite a lot of oil had leaked and it covered the floor of the lowest deck. He immediately went to Ahab with news of the problem. Captain, we must stop this ship and send all the men to the barrels to stop the leak, Starbuck told the captain. If we don't, we will lose more oil in a day than we can make in a year. Let it leak. I will not stop the ship. Now get out of my cabin. What will the owners of the ship say? replied Starbuck. What do I care about the owners? They are always complaining anyway. Captain, this is madness. Ahab took a musket from his table and pointed it at Starbuck. There is one god that is lord of this earth, and one captain who is lord of the Peckard. Now get out! You have greatly angered me, captain, but I will not tell you to be scared of me. You would only laugh, but I will tell you to be scared of yourself, replied the red-faced Starbuck. The captain put down his musket and looked at Starbuck for a few moments. Ahab, be scared of Ahab. Ha, huh. yes, you are right. You're a good man, Starbuck. Now stop the ship and check the oil. Chapter 4 A Coffin for Kikek The tough journey began to make my good friend Kikek ill. He became thinner and thinner and eventually caught a fever. As the days passed, it looked like he might die. I didn't even want to think of it, but he seemed to believe that he would die. One day he made a strange request. On his home island, when people died, they were placed on a canoe with some of the things they owned in life. This canoe was then sent out into the sea so that it could float away to heaven. And so he asked for a canoe to be built for him, so that when he died he could go to heaven. The ship's carpenter was immediately ordered to do what Kike asked for. When it was finished, Kikeg had a close look at the canoe. He then put his harpoon and his strange little god, Yodo, in the canoe, as well as some biscuits and a bottle of fresh water. These were for his journey to heaven. Having done this, he lay down in the coffin to see if it was comfortable. After some minutes, he whispered to himself, Ramai, it will do, it is easy. Then he asked us to put him back in his hammock. The mad pip had been watching this and went to talk to Kikeg. Kikek, if you get to heaven, will you help me? Please look for Pip, and if you find him, please comfort him. He must be very sad, because he has forgotten to take his tambourine. He then ran away, shaking the tambourine as he went. Kikek listened without saying anything. He was thinking. He then told me that he had decided that he didn't want to die. I asked him if a man could decide if he lived or died. If man won't live... No sick can kill him, he replied. In good time, Kikeg became strong again. He stayed in his hammock, but ate and ate and ate. After a few days, he jumped to his feet and said that he was healthy again. Soon after this, the boat reached the Pacific Ocean. Captain Ahab went to see the ship's smith, a man called Perth. He wanted Perth to make him a new harpoon. After it was made, Ahab and Fedala went to look at it. Fedela whispered some words in his own language. I don't know if this was a bless or a curse on the harpoon. Is this to kill Moby Dick? asked the smith. Yes, it is. Now bring me the three harpooners, said the captain. Tashtego, Kikek and Dagur arrived in the smith's room. I need some blood, my pagan harpooners. I need to baptize this harpoon. What do you say? said Ahab to his men. The three pagans all agreed to give some of their blood, and the harpoon was then dipped into this blood. As he did this, Ahab passionately shouted a few words in Latin, and the baptism of the harpoon was then completed. But Ahab had baptised the harpoon in the name of the devil, not in the name of God. A few weeks passed, 
and the Pequod sailed further into the Pacific Ocean. The first ship that it met in this enormous sea was the Bachelor. It was also from Nantucket. The Bachelor had had a very successful time in its search for whales. The whole ship was full of whale oil. There was even oil kept in the captain's rooms. So there was no more whaling to be done for this lucky ship. It was going home. The two ships stopped next to each other, and the captain of the Bachelor invited Ahab to come onto his boat and have a glass of wine. Have you seen the white whale? cried Ahab. No, I've only heard of him, came the reply. You are too happy, man. Haven't you lost any men? Only two, but my ship is full of oil, and now I can go home. Well, my ship is empty, and so I must go whaling. And so the two ships left each other, one happily sailing in the breeze, the other one less lucky and sailing into a storm. The seas of Japan are normally warm and pleasant to sail in. However, they are also known to have the worst storms called typhoons. The unfortunate Pequod found itself in the middle of such a storm a few days after leaving the Bachelor. The sea is a strange thing, and in less than an hour the ship went from calm waters to thunder and lightning. Stubb and Starbuck stood together on the ship of the deck. Stubb was singing. Be quiet, Stubb, you coward, shouted Starbuck. Let the typhoon sing. I am not a brave man. I never said I was. I am a coward, and I sing to stop worrying. The only way to stop me singing is to cut my throat. Madman. Do you think that God has only mercy for people with serious faces? I think God likes laughing men as much as serious men. Suddenly, all three main sails were hit by lightning. For a second, the whole boat was lit up. The noise was incredible. When lightning hits a ship... Unusual things happen and fires can start almost anywhere on the ship. But this time the fire started only in one place. Slowly the whole crew of the ship began to look at Ahab. He was standing, holding his harpoon, and from the metal tip of the weapon a small blue flame could be seen. It looked like a snake's tongue. Ahab could see that his crew were frightened. You all promised me that you would hunt the white whale. You will follow me to the end. Now I will blow out your fear. And so, with one breath, he put out the flame. That night, Ahab and Fedela stood together on the deck of the ship. Fedela, who had supernatural powers, said to Ahab, I have seen things. What have you seen? I have seen the future. What of it? Firstly, I will die before you even if we are the last two men left on the ship. But you will see me again, after I have died. And secondly, only rope can kill you. Only rope? You mean the gallows. Well then, ha ha ha, I am immortal, cried Ahab with a laugh. Immortal on land and sea. Afterwards both were silent again. Later that night, the storm passed over the ship and went to the other parts of the ocean. In the quiet hours before the sun came up into the sky, the shouts of men could be heard in the sea. One of the crew decided these must be the cries of dead sailors, and he predicted an evil future for the ship. Ahab was asleep when this was happening, and he heard nothing about it until he woke up in the morning. He told the crews the noises must be from seals, whose cries sometimes sounded like the cries of men. Later, at sunrise, a man fell over the side of the ship. The life boy, a long piece of wood, was thrown into the water to help the man float, but he was never seen again and was lost to the sea. The life boy was also lost and had to be replaced, but there was no more wood to make it. Kikeg suggested his coffin be used for this job. A coffin for a life boy? cried Starbuck. <laughs> Rather strange, said Stubb. It will do for now. Bring the carpenter on deck, said Flask. And so the carpenter was told to make the coffin into a life buoy. After he had done this, the coffin was tied with a rope to the ship and then put over the side. It swung from the back of the ship almost like a tail. Chapter 5 Moby Dick is finally seen. The next day, 
a large ship, the Rachel, was seen coming in the direction of the Pequod. Have you seen the white whale? asked Ahab. We saw her yesterday. Have you seen a whale boat on the seas? came the reply. The question was surprising, and Ahab answered no. But he was very happy to finally hear some news of Moby Dick, and wanted to speak to the captain of the other ship as soon as possible. However, the other captain was even faster. He quickly lowered a boat and was soon on the deck of the Pequod. As he stepped onto the boat, he was recognised by many of the crew as a sailor from Nantucket. Ahab did not even say hello before he started to ask about the whale. Where is he? Not killed? Please don't say that he has been killed! The other captain told his own story of how the ship had met with a great whale. Late the previous day, they had seen a group of whales and sent three of their boats out to hunt them. After they had gone four or five miles, the white back of Moby Dick was seen, and a fourth boat was sent out to follow him. Unfortunately, Moby Dick was travelling in a different direction to the others, and within an hour the Rachel could not see the fourth boat any more. After the hunt was over, the three boats returned to the Rachel, and the search started for the other boat. A great fire was lit on the deck of the ship, but nothing was seen of the last boat. After he had told this story, he then asked Ahab if their two ships could join together to search for the missing boat. Ahab listened without saying anything. My boy, my own son is on that missing boat. For God's sake, I beg you to help me, cried the captain. I will pay you for your time. I will pay you very well if you can help me. His son, cried Stubb. Well, what do you say, Ahab? If it's his own boy, then we must help him. Ahab, who had so far said nothing, finally gave the captain his reply. I will not do it. Goodbye and good luck. Soon the two ships were sailing in their different directions. After an hour, the Rachel could still be seen from the Pequod, searching the sea for her lost children. The Pequod continued to sail across the sea, the lifebuoy coffin still swinging from the back of the ship. The next boat that the Pequod met was the Delight, a most unfortunate and incorrect name for the ship. Although it still floated on the sea, it was a wreck, and most of it had been badly damaged. "'Have you all seen the white whale?' shouted Ahab. "'Look at my ship!' the tired-looking captain shouted back. Oh, "'Did you kill him?' "'Kill him? The harpoon has not been made that could ever kill Moby Dick. "'That very harpoon is on this boat!' Then I wish you good luck. Today I will bury my men who were killed by that whale. Having said this, he turned and looked at his crew. The bodies of the dead sailors were on the deck of the boat, and so the funeral was about to begin. The Pequod sailed away from a sad ship. As it sailed away, the back of the boat could be seen by the men of the Delight. Look, men, shouted the captain of the Delight. The strangers leave our funeral and then show us their coffin. Two more days passed, and having heard nothing from the men at the top of the masts, Ahab decided to have himself raised to the top of the ship. Before the captain reached halfway up, he cried like a seabird. There she blows! There she blows! Back like a snow owl! It's Moby Deck! Immediately the order was given to put the three waning boats into the water. Starbuck was left behind to captain the Pequod. When they got close to the whale, it dived deep into the sea and could not be seen for some time. The birds! The birds! cried Tashtego. A group of white sea birds had been following the boats, and now they were flying a few metres from Ahab's boat. The birds can see much better than any man, thought Ahab, as he looked into the dark ocean. As he looked, he noticed a white spot getting bigger in the sea under the boat. It was Moby Dick. He quickly turned the boat, and was able to avoid the attack of the whale as it flew out of the water. He was close enough to see the huge open mouth. The whale's teeth were long and white. Ahab was not so lucky when the animal attacked a second time. Moby Dick, with his evil intelligence, saw how the boat was moving, and as his huge body came out of the water, he was close enough to bite one side of the boat. 
It was impossible for the tiny boat to survive such an attack, and it quickly split in half, sending the captain and his crew into the sea. Moby Dick swam quickly round and round the wrecked boat and its crew. The sight of the smashed boat seemed to send him mad, and he swam around it in closer and closer circles. The centre of this circle was clearly Ahab himself. To save himself, he shouted to the crew of the Peckod, Sail on the whale! Drive him away! The Peckod did what it was asked, and sailed between the whale and its victims. The great fish swam off, and the other boats came to the rescue. Ahab was pulled into Stubb's boat. With eyes almost blinded from the sea water, he lay at the bottom of the boat, breathing heavily. After some minutes, he felt well enough to speak. The harpoon! Is it safe? Aye, sir, it wasn't used this time, replied Stubb. Give it to me, then. Are any of the men from my boat missing? Sir, all of them are safe. After this first meeting with the whale, the smaller ships returned to the Peckod, where they could continue the chase. At regular intervals, the whale could be seen rising to the surface of the sea to breathe. Each time some water was sent up from it. The day passed and the whale was still too far away for the smaller boats to be sent out. Night time came. Can't see him blowing water now, sir. Too dark, cried a voice from the air. In what direction was he travelling? Same as before, sir. Good. He will travel slower now it's night. We must not pass him before morning. Come down from the mast and get some rest. The deck is mine for the rest of this dark night. Having said this, he put his wide hat low over his forehead and stood on the deck, not moving, until the sun rose. Chapter 6 The Chase Second Day As the sun rose, there were men on the tops of each mast again. Did you see him? cried Ahab to the men on the mast. See nothing, sir, was the reply. All men on deck, he travels faster than I thought. With the crew working hard, the ship was soon moving fast, and within an hour the whale was seen in the unending ocean. There she blows! She blows! She blows! Right ahead! was the cry from the top of the mast. Aye, aye! cried Stubb. I knew it! You can't escape! Oh, well, the mad devil himself is after you! And Stubb spoke for all the crew. The difficulties of the chase created a mad atmosphere in the boat. The hunt for the whale was like wine for the crew. It took away any fear they might have for the great fight that was ahead of them. They were one man, not thirty, all running the same race, and all were directed to that fatal goal. Ahab, their one lord, was leading them to the one thing that could destroy them. The men on the top of the masts had been told to shout whenever they saw the whale blow water, but for some minutes no more cries were heard. Why do you not sing out if you see him? cried Ahab. Men, you have been tricked by the early morning light. That cannot have been Moby Dick. His blows are regular as he rises and dives in the water. Moby Dick does not blow once and then disappears. It was even so. In their enthusiasm, the men had mistaken some other thing for the whale. But Ahab could not be fooled so easily, and as soon as he reached his own watch point, he spotted the whale. As he cried out, the whole of the crew cheered with him. Such was their madness for the blood of the whale. Less than a mile ahead, Moby Dick's body exploded into view above the water. This wasn't a calm and peaceful blowing, not like a garden fountain, no. The white whale now showed his location in the most spectacular way. Using all the power of his enormous body and swimming up from the deepest depths, the sperm whale flew from the water and his entire weight was, for a single moment, completely in the air over the surface of the ocean. As he crashed back into the sea, he left behind a mountain of foam which could be seen for miles around. This is the last morning you will see the sun so clearly, Ahab said to himself, and then to the rest of the crew, Men, lower the boats! Then to Mr. Starbuck, 
the ship is yours. Don't get too close to the boats, but also don't go too far away from them. But Moby Dick was not so easily terrified, and rather than be hunted, he preferred to do the hunting. The great whale turned himself around, and with all his strength he started to swim towards the three whaling boats. With incredible speed, he rushed between the boats with his huge mouth open and his tail swinging from side to side. With skill learned from many years of sailing the seas of the world, the whalers were just able to avoid this deadly attack. Like bullfighters, they twisted and turned, and when given the chance, they made their own attacks. In time, the whale had been hit by harpoons from each of the boats. Such is the animal intelligence of this fish that he swam between, around and under the three boats, and soon the ropes that attached the whale to the boats were twisted together into one line. Ahab's boat began to be pulled under water, and the sea captain knew there was only one thing to be done. Taking out his knife, he cut the rope that held his boat to the whale. After this, the two remaining boats, captained by Flask and Stub, were both pulled together by the whale, which was now swimming deep into the sea. The ships were smashed together with great force, and were both wrecked, leaving the crews in the water and in great danger. Flask floated in the water while quickly moving his legs to escape the mouths of hungry sharks which might be passing. Stubb spent his time shouting for somebody to take him out of the deadly water. Suddenly, Ahab's boat was lifted from the water as if being carried by invisible wires towards heaven. The white whale came straight up out of the water with the boat resting on its forehead. This attack turned the boat upside down and left the crew in the water. Happy with the destruction he had caused, the whale gently swam in circles in the water, and whenever he touched anything, for example a piece of floating wood, he would raise his great tail out of the water and bring it down on the object he didn't like. As before, the peckod was needed to rescue the crews of the smaller boats. The men were lifted into the ship, and any equipment that could be saved from the water was also picked up. When Ahab was brought onto the ship, his false leg had been broken. No other broken bones, I hope, sir, said Stubb. Look at me, Stubb. Even with a broken leg, the great Ahab is still unhurt. Now, how many men from the boats are still missing? Stubb looked around the ship's crew and suddenly cried, Fedela! He must have been caught in the harpoon's ropes! Fedela! Where is Fedela? He can't be missing. Find him. He must be found. But as Stubb had thought, Fedela was missing from the ship and could not be seen in the water. Cart on my own line. Gone, gone. What can such a small word mean? The harpoon, too. Was it not me who threw it into the fish? What a fool I have been, cried Ahab. But his unhappy mood quickly turned into anger. I'll kill that fish, even if I have to sail ten times around the world. I will kill him. Good God, cried Starbuck. You will never catch him, can't you see? In Jesus' name, we should end this. It is an evil task. Are we all to be taken to the bottom of the sea? We should end this while we still can. Ahab was a strong and stubborn man, and he would not change his mind so easily. Men, for two days we have hunted him. Tomorrow will be the third. He will rise once more in the morning, but only to breathe his last breath. Do you feel brave, men? Brave? As fearless as fire, cried Stubb. Aye, Fedela has gone, but we will continue, replied Ahab. As night came, the whale was still in sight, and everything continued as it had the previous night. A new leg was made for the captain, and the extra boats were equipped for the next day's hunting. And of course, Ahab stood on the deck of the boat, looking eastward and waiting for the sun to rise. Chapter 7 The Chase Third Day The morning of the third day was fresh, and the weather was warm and sunny. 
As before, three men were sent to the top of the masts, and after a few minutes Ahab cried, D-O-C-M! But the men could see nothing, and so this continued until midday. Ahab became more and more impatient, until eventually he shouted, Raise me to the top of the mast! Sir, what do you hope to see that the men up there cannot? asked Stubb. See? Ahab doesn't see. He fails, came the reply from the captain. And so using ropes, the crew raised Ahab to the top of the mast where he was able to view the ocean for miles around. Another hour passed when suddenly Ahab shouted that he had seen the whale. Again, the crew worked quickly to lower the boats into the water. Just as Ahab was about to climb in, he turned to Starbuck. Starbuck! Sir? Some ships sail from their ports and are never seen again. It's a sad truth, sir. And some men die young, while others live to an old age. Starbuck, I am an old man. Shake hands with me, man. Their hands met. Their eyes met. Starbuck's eyes showed tears. Captain, please, don't go. Finish with this madness. The captain was unemotional and dropped the other man's hand. Lower the boat, he commanded. Suddenly a voice was heard from the captain's room on the ship. It was Pip. The sharks! The sharks! he cried. My master come back! Ahab's ears were deaf to the boy's cries, but strangely he spoke the truth. As soon as Ahab's boat touched the surface of the water, a group of sharks began to follow the boat. They bit at the oars of the boat each time they dipped into the water. This was very strange, as the sailors had not seen any sharks around any of the boats before. They seemed like vultures waiting for food. What's more, the two other boats which were following the great whale were not troubled by the group of sharks. After a long struggle, the boats reached a point close to where the whale was expected to rise from the water. Again, the whale was not happy to be hunted, and when he reached the surface, he began to attack the ships with his broad tail. His first attack damaged both Stubbs and Flask's boats. The Goon Kikeg were not able to throw their harpoons at the great fish, but Ahab was not troubled by the whale's attacks. As the whale's huge body passed Ahab's boat, a cry of horror was heard. Tied to the whale by the previous day's harpoon lines was the body of Fedela. Although he was dead, his eyes were still open. They stared at Ahab as the whale passed by. Ahab dropped the harpoon he was holding. What you said was true, Fedela. I see you again even after death. The whale had changed direction and the attack was brought closer to the peacock. Starbuck could see the devastation and cried to his captain for the last time. Ahab, it is not too late, even today on the third day. Moby Dick is swimming away from us. It is not the whale that attacks you, but you who attacks the whale. Let the monster go. It is madness to continue. But Ahab would not listen. He continued to follow the whale while the two damaged boats returned to the Peckod to be repaired. It is difficult to know if the white whale became tired or whether he had some evil idea. Whichever of these is true, Ahab was able to sail faster than the fish, and soon the captain was standing at the front of the small boat with his harpoon in his hand. The sharks continued to follow his boat and caused problems to the crew with their continued attacks. Do the sharks follow to eat the whale or to eat me? Ahab said to himself. After a short time, the whale could be seen again, and Ahab threw his harpoon into the hated fish. The crew held on tightly to the rope, which attached them to their enemy. Again, the white whale changed direction and swam towards the peacock. Perhaps it wished to destroy something larger than the tiny whaling boat. Moby Dick's huge mouth opened. He was ready to destroy the ship. The whale! The ship! cried the crew of Ahab's boat. Work harder! You must get me closer if I am to harpoon the whale a second time, shouted Ahab. But Ahab's heart was filled with darkness. 
he began to wonder if he and his crew could survive the attack. As he was thinking, the whale's head rose from the water and smashed into the side of the peacock. This knocked a hole in the side of the ship, and the captain watched powerless as the water rushed in. As the whaling boat approached the peacock, Ahab made one last effort to save his ship and kill the whale. He raised his arm and threw the harpoon into the fish. The injured whale swam deep into the ocean, taking the harpoon line with him. Ahab stepped back from the rope in the boat, but was too slow. The next moment he flew off the side of the boat and disappeared into the deep water. The crew knew they would never see him again. For an instant they stood still. Then, looking around, they cried as one man, The ship! Great God, where is the ship? Only the upper parts of the mast showed. The rest had sunk deep into the water. As the ship sank, it began to form a whirlpool in the water, which took down all those who had sailed on it. The tiny boat was soon pulled into this devastation and disappeared under the ocean. And so this is how Ahab and his ship ended. But how did I, Ishmael, survive to tell you this story? Well, after Fedullah died, I was chosen to take his place in Ahab's boat. I felt the pull of the whirlpool on me and knew I was powerless to stop myself being pulled under the water. Just as I thought I was breathing my last breath of air, Kikeg's coffin, filled with air, flew up from the whirlpool. It hadn't sunk with the rest of the boat, so I was able to hold on tightly to this and avoid a watery death. After a day on the water I began to lose hope of surviving, but on the second day my luck changed and I saw a ship on the horizon. It was the Rachel, still looking for her missing child, but instead it found the orphan of the Peckot. Mm-hmm.